Guys, have a seat. And I'm just, I'm honored to get to come back and be with you guys again. Somerset. I told you last week is where uh, my wife spent some, some time in Somerset. So her family had a little farm out this way. So, so she learned how to ride on the front of a tractor like all good little country girls do. And feed the cows and all that good stuff. And her granny used to work here decades ago. And so it's just an honor for me to get to bring uh, the word of the Lord here. We talked last week about what? Right. Right. So like, please, someone remember, please, so I think it's me and Steve, we're connected, all right. Well, okay, she slept through it, we talked about grace. The word was grace, I said it a lot, lots of verses. We talked about how grace is this, like, unmerited favor from God. It's how, how God makes right what we can't get right. And if you see the word grace in the Bible, it's often followed by a what word? Peace. Peace. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today. Paul signs most of his letters, grace and peace. I've been signing letters for decades, grace and peace. Uh, if I wish you a happy birthday on Facebook, I write grace and peace and happy birthday. Uh, these are just words that I say on a regular basis. And I don't want them to be regular words, though, like they get so familiar because we use them so often. So I've been struggling through peace this week. Oh, it's peace. <coughs> it's easy. Oh, my. <laughs> Have you ever... Prayed for patience. <laughs> and you like, don't pray for patience because God can't just hear patience. No, it's, He brings you through trials and tribulations and, and battles, and, and then if you learn patience through that, preparing a message on peace has been like that for me this week. I'm like, oh my, this is brutally difficult. I've just racked my brain, I've set a computer, I've gone for a walk, I'm like, I need to get things figured out, and then there's the circumstances that came into my life this week that did not bring peace whatsoever, and I'm not going to list them, but um, I don't want to abuse you guys as cheap therapy to talk about my problems. <laughs> but I just want to say that I identify with you. If you walk in today going, I don't have peace. Or like, I'm going to have peace for a little while here, but then I'm going to go back out in the world and that peace is going to leave me. And I'm like, I need the peace, the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding. It's where we start in the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul writes about peace. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says it like this. Do not be anxious about anything. I'd stop right there and say, oh, Paul, you don't know my life. I have so much to be anxious about. But then if you look at Paul's life, I think he wins. If we were having an anxiety competition, he wins on the circumstantial evidence of ability to let's say, hey, I've got all the reason to be anxious. People keep trying to kill me, beat me, fight against the word of God that I used to fight against. Paul had reason to be anxious, but he writes to us, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guard your hearts. Guard your hearts. Heart guard. I'm going to see who my friends are in the room. How many of you have a dog? Your dog people in the room. All right. So with that dogs. Okay. On the count of three, just shout out your dog's name. One, two, three. Surprise! We sound like a church full of people that lost their dog. Raj! My dog's Raj. Raj's a... Raj is a big old Labrador. The whole, he's the mayor of the neighborhood, I say. Everyone in our neighborhood knows my dog, Raj. Um, and, and I guard his heart with heart guard. Because if you've ever had a dog that gets heart worms, it's so dangerous to the dog and it's expensive to treat. Yeah, right, right. So we took in a stray one time. We found this beautiful stray Labrador. He'd been, he'd been a stray for six months living in the wild. No one could capture him. We captured him. We brought him home. We called him Buddy. But he had heartworms, right? Because if you get a dog that's been stray for long enough, he's probably got, got the heartworms. So he had heartworms. We treated him. It was expensive. It took a toll on his body. I said, I will never, ever, ever have a dog have heartworms as long as I can help it. So my boy Raj, Raj is almost 10. So for years now, every month on, on month, I give him his medicine exactly on the 17th. I don't miss a day. And I forget a lot of stuff. I'm a forgetful person. You probably already forget like that. Yes, you diagnose me accurately. I do have ADHD. I come from a family of people with ADHD. We forget a lot, but we have a lot of fun. <laughs> you recognize me. Every month I give Rods his medicine because I don't want him to get heartworms. Now, I'm making a long thing about dogs, but I'm trying to make a point here. What if, what if we were at least as diligent 
to guard our own hearts from worry as we are to guard our dog's hearts from worms. Go take care of my dog, but myself, like, I'm good. I just keep rolling. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'll be all right. But sometimes, like, when the check engine light of your soul comes on, you're like, something's wrong with my heart. I gotta check my heart. Because I gotta have this, this peace, the peace of God. Shut up. In all the situations of anxiety, all the circumstances that would, would cause you to worry, take everything by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, with a thankful heart, bring it all to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. That will guard our hearts. So the peace is what we want, the peace. What is peace? Let's make sure we're on the same page when we talk about peace. Peace is divine as like tranquility, harmony, security. I feel safe in this. In the Old Testament, the primary Hebrew word for peace is what? Shalom. Yeah, we're all speaking Hebrew now. Shalom. Say it with me. Shalom. Yeah, this old Hebrew, we see again and again, it's, a, it's an ongoing theme throughout the scriptures. I want peace with God, peace with each other, inner peace within myself so I'm not so full of anxiety and worry. The shalom has like this, this carries this connotation of this wholeness. I'm walking in step with God. Peace. Peace has been the standard greeting in many cultures throughout the generations. And today, you went around to different places. They, they say shalom when they greet each other or variations of that. Peace is also uh, the tagline of old hippies, modern day hip hop culture. Peace, 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 peace. We speak about peace a lot. So it's, it's not surprising to us that peace is such a valuable commodity since it's a value that it would be also counterfeited. There's a lot of fake peace going around. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah saw this. Jeremiah uh, 6 verse 14 he says that they have treated my people's brokenness superficially claiming peace, peace. There is no peace. So from thousands of years ago, Jeremiah the prophet, they, they say there's peace over there but there's not peace. Fast forward to today, we can see the same thing the exact same thing. When they say there's peace there, I don't feel peace. But not the peace that surpasses all understanding at least. So, just think about some of the ways we see peace in its false form. Let's identify it a little bit. I would say here's like four counterfeit attempts at peace. Four failed attempts at peace on earth. Earth um, around us and earth, like, you know, peace in ourselves, our peace with God. Here's ways we fail at peace. One, one of the ways we fail at peace is peace through addiction. Like all the things that we can be addicted to, whether they are bad and harmful and illegal, or they're just good and they're our hobbies, but we still become so abundantly addicted to them, they become like small little, little G gods in our life. They give me a little bit of peace for a little bit of time. Peace through addiction says, it feels good, at least for a little bit. But then after a while, it takes, it takes more and more of that same thing to bring you just that same amount of little peace. Addiction says, Next time will be enough. So, whether it's alcohol, drugs, food, sex, hobbies, whatever those little things are, we find a little bit of peace through those things that get us addicted. And we have failed in our many attempts to find peace through our addictions. If only there was someone who could cure our cravings and our thirsts and our hungers and, and give us something so that we would never thirst and hunger anymore. So maybe it's not addictions for you, maybe it's addiction. We find peace through addition. Addition says, I just need more. Just a little bit more. And a little bit more. And so it can cover up the, the hole inside me. It can, can help the hole in my heart and, and just fill it with stuff. Any stuff will do. Any stuff can be filler, if you will. The, there's the addition of just distractions. I know there's a painful problem over here. There's a cancer in my soul, but I'm just going to cover it with more good stuff. Pass the nachos. And I'm just going to scroll for hours. Those little things, little things that we just add on, add on. It can even be work. I'm just going to work harder. If I work harder, I can, I can distract myself from the fact that I don't have peace. But hard work can be rewarding, so it puffs us up with pride. We get puffed up to a sense of going, well, if I just add more, peace through addition. But we failed at our many attempts to find peace through addition. 
If only there was someone who could add the only thing that we really need. And maybe it's not addition, maybe it's then it's subtraction. Subtraction says, I can get peace if I just stop doing the bad stuff. Less, less stuff, less of the unhealthy foods, less debt, less debt, less stress, less scrolling through my phone. You become like the, the minimalist Zen approach. If I just do, do, do so much less, then maybe I will find the peace. But if peace could be attained by subtraction, well, then the grace we talked about last week, grace would be irrelevant. Why do I need grace? All I need to do is just stop. Just stop it. <laughs> stop doing the bad stuff. If I do that, then I'll have, then I'll have peace. But the truth of the matter is that, that peace through addition or peace by, peace by subtraction, those are all the things of the world religions. All the false religions of the world saying, just take care of yourself. And if there's a God out there, he's going to grade on a curve to see that you're good. You've done more good than bad. That's what all the world religions say. You can work yourself there. But we have failed on our many attempts to find peace through subtraction. If only there was someone who could take away what's causing all of our need for peace. If there was someone that could take away our sin. One more, one more way I've seen this, and there's many other ways we try to find peace or try to manufacture peace. It's peace through complacency. Complacency just has less like, just lower your expectations. Why do you gotta try to do all that? Just, how about man? Man's not a complete sentence or a word, but it's spoken in my house <coughs> about by my teenage sons that it feels like a complete sentence. <laughs> man. I can pick it on since they're not here today. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're laughing because you've seen teenagers too, or maybe you've been like that. Just, just lower your expectations. You can be at peace with the fact that peace is unattainable. Good. No, you can't get there, but at least get as good as you can get. And then it becomes apathy. <coughs> apathy is easy. To be apathetic, to have an apathetic heart is not a guarded heart. But apathy seems really easy. Settling. Settling is natural. And just settle. And so you can have peace by just lowering your expectations. But I would say we have failed at our many attempts to find peace through complacency. If only there was someone who promised life and life in abundance. And so when I, I look and I list these different attempts at, at peace, what I see, I see is a person that's puffed up. I would say that the opposite of peace is war, but it's, it's a war fueled by pride. If you look at the, the, the root cause of our wars, it's, it's, the, it's the pride in us that puffs us up and quarrels among us. So we look at these failed attempts at peace. I see a person who's full of themselves. A person puffed up and full of themselves is at war with themselves. Their heart's not guarded. Their mind is racing with wars and selfish insecurities. So I would say the opposite of peace is pride. And to, to demonstrate this, if you will allow me, going forward anyway, my years as a youth pastor, I used to do this stunt. They would talk about what, what pride looks like, to get a, a, a visual image of what pride looks like. I haven't done this in years, but I think I can still do it. If I can, someone get 911 on speed dial. Requires earplugs on my part, you'll be fine. When I think of someone that's, that's full of pride, full of being puffed up, full of themselves, it's like, it's like they've got a glove on their head. And they're thinking, I don't need anyone but me. <laughs> You're so puffed up with yourself that every story ends up being about you. <laughs> you can't celebrate other people's lives because you're so busy just focused on your own being puffed up. <laughs> but a life puffed up with itself is eventually going to explode. Pride looks ridiculous on you? This is what pride looks like. Pride puffs up. And you know who opposes pride? God opposes pride. <laughs> I 
I couldn't get it to pop because I didn't get the seal under my snotty nose. <laughs> speaks to the way the way the wind and the waves and they, they listen to him they obey him they recognize oh that's the voice that's the voice from the beginning that told us how far we can go and no farther so that's the source we're considering when he said my peace I give you Jesus has a PhD in peace he's the prince of peace there's other influences of peace around the world you might think of of, of old school Peace people like John Lennon of the Beatles, Give Peace a Chance, or, or Gandhi, or the Dalai Lama, or Dolly Parton, uh, all these people. <laughs> hey, Dolly brings peace in this yes, earth. Yes, sir. But how far can it go? Like, there's good intentions, but then there's also, hey, you're limited by your own reach and your own life. Jesus is not limited by either of those. 
Jesus has unlimited power to do the work of peace. From, the, from his own grave, he said, I'm not going to stay in there. And he came alive. So the empty grave of, of Jesus, I think, gives us an incredible reason to consider what he would say when he says, I give you my peace. My peace I leave you. So we consider the source. He is the Son of God. We need peace with God in order to have the peace of God. And Jesus is providing that. In fact, that's what he says next. Uh, an, another thing, another truth we learn from this is that he says, I give to you. Peace is a gift, much like we talked about grace. Grace is a gift. We don't do anything to earn it. Jesus says also, I will give you my peace. It's a gift. And the thing about a gift is that it has to be given and it has to be received. By way of analogy, how many of you, uh, you probably have it one in your closet right now. If you went in your closet, you would find a wrapped present and you have no idea who it goes to. Oh, just me and my house. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap a gift, find a gift, and, and then forget to give it to a person for Christmas or their birthday. And they go, oh, oh. And then you give it to them on like a random, you know, random bit of the month. Because you had a gift, you forgot to give it to them. It's not like that with Christ, right? He has his gift. He's going to give this to us. He remembers it. He treasures it. He treasures us. So he gives us the gift. But then the other end, it has to be received. You have to receive the gift. Because Jesus is giving us something that's going to help us guard our hearts. His peace. The gift of peace must be received. Or, there's an option. You can say, actually, no thanks. I'm, I'm good. I don't want your gift. I'm, I'm going to sit here with my own pride-filled, puffed-up attempts at counterfeit peace. Or, we can receive peace. I'm doing some sign language. If I speak sign language, I learned a few phrases to teach all day. Receiving is this. It's like, like you're grabbing a rope, like you're going to grab and, and, and you're pulling it, you know, pulling it to you. This is receive. Do this with me, will you? And do some sign language. This is grabbing. This is receive. Awesome. You are receiving right here. What are you receiving? You're receiving peace. This is peace. This is fun. So this is like kind of this is, ooh, ooh, sound effects too. It sounds good, good in church. Oh, we're confident in Baptist church. Can we do that? No. <laughs> this is this peace in sign language is two things. It, this is welcome. And this is like become. You're becoming. So you, kind of like, you think your hands kind of swooshing together is becoming. This is become. Become. This is sign language for what? Do you know? Do you have a yes? No. Quiet. It's like this whoosh. So let's do, let's do peace together. Peace. Be, become quiet. So this week when I was writing this sermon, I did this a lot. When I'm just, my head is racked and there's circumstances and I'm broken hearted for someone. I'm grieving over here and Oh, I'll go until I start crying. But it's good. It's good healthy tears because God's with me. And I'm going, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, peace. <laughs> I'm just do this. And I'm just kind of, it became almost like a, a physical, tangible way of going, God's got me. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming quiet. <laughs> and it's like, you breathe that when you quiet. <laughs> so by God's grace, he's bringing peace. And he gives us, he gives us some tangible ways. So it's his gift. It's what he's giving us. And then we receive it. Not as the world gives. Pay attention to those words. Because you go, <coughs> good. Because I've been given some things from the world. And it hurts. Or it was so temporary. But you have a choice. You have a choice. You can receive what, what Jesus gives or you can receive what the world gives. I had a choice driving over here today. I was driving from Holotus on, on 1604. There's, there's two lanes. I had a choice. Just like you've had a choice many times. There is two different cars you can be behind right now. One car was a nice new car, safe car, it's a Camry. Driven by someone who's staying in the lines, who looks like they're paying attention and awake and not on their phone. On the other lane, the optional lane behind an older car, broken tail light, bumper hanging on by baling wire and duct tape, a little erratic in, the, in, the, in their inconsistency to stay in the lane. You have a choice which lane you choose. The world that's inconsistent, barely held together with bailing wire and duct tape with a broken tail light, is so unpredictable, you don't know which way it's gonna go. Or you get in the lane with Jesus says, my path, my word, light into your path. It's an everlasting path, it's a straight path, it's a sure path. We know where it's going. It's going to the Father. 
and he can be trusted. So there's the choice. We say, as the world gives, I can follow that way, but it leads to destruction a thousand times. Just think about this. Think of all the peace treaties of the world. We've had generations and generations of wars and warfare, and occasionally we come together like in a peace treaty. Hundreds of peace treaties. Majority of them only last a couple of years. That's what the world does. The world can try to make peace, but then in the end, the pride, the selfish, puffed up pride interferes and it gets in the way of peace. Because that's what Jesus says. I don't give you as the world gives. You've seen that and it's so temporary. The best the world can do is like a ceasefire. God gives us something better than that. The world cannot give us the, the peace that helps us to become quiet. The world basically just adds noise on top of noise to try to cover up something. The world gives peace like in small portions and then it demands a super high price. How high is the price? enough to trouble your heart. That's the fourth thing, fourth thing I'd like to say from what Jesus says here. Don't let your hearts be troubled. But Jesus, you also said in this world you will have troubles. Yes. You will have troubles. But don't let your heart be troubled. Guard your heart. Let the peace of God guard your heart. So grace is for when we're in trouble. Peace is for when we are troubled. When I look at these words from Jesus, I just want to make sure we get the chronologic understanding. When did Jesus say this? Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled or fearful. When did Jesus say this? Did he say it before or after his death on the cross? He spoke these words before. Jesus said, I leave you my peace. He said these words just moments before the epitome of humanity, selfish, sinful, puffed up pride, would have him arrested and put on a mock trial and have him crucified. The Apostle John records these words. That's why it says John, chapter 14. John saw this. He recorded it. And I'm sure he asked some questions as he saw what happened next. Our Savior. The only solution to our, our problem of not having peace with God, our Savior was, was, was hung high, stretched wide. He died on this cross for, for you and I. And Paul, I mean, sorry, John is right there at the foot of the cross, right next to the mother of Jesus. Mary's there. She's got no peace. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Are you kidding me? Can you see the trouble that we're in? In fact, the apostles would run and hide because they weren't sure if they were next. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You can imagine John wondering, what kind of peace is this? Was Jesus wrong? Or worse, was Jesus lying? Well, here's the tension. Here's the tension. And we pay attention to the tension. Jesus said he gave us his peace. But what about all the suffering? What about the wars, the atrocities, the abuse, the sickness? Where's peace in the midst of the wars we read about in our history books? Where's the peace in the midst of the war we're going to see when we turn on the news today? Where is peace in the midst of, of school shootings, human trafficking, lives ripped apart by unfaithfulness? And on and on we go, and on and on we go, the way we start to get our blood boiled. Good. Hey, Pastor, you could have landed the sermon and ended that thing about five minutes ago. We've been fine. We've seen the last song get out of here. But it wouldn't be faithful to the tension that we struggle with. C.S. Lewis said this. C.S. Lewis is a favorite author and theologian. He said, I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name is grief. I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name was grief. And so when I think about this grief and I think about my anger, what if our grief is also God's grief? Like God sees our troubles, sees our suffering, and God is in the process of giving us his peace. Because God sees the big picture, right? We go back to the beginning of the Bible, the very first book in Genesis. And God said, let there be light. God said, let there be the, the sun and the stars and the, and the waters and the plants and the animals. And God's creating. He's going on creating for you. And just say the word. And there it was. And it was what? It was good. It was good. 
But we look around today and go, there's a lot of stuff that's just not good. When God made the very first man, right? he, he didn't just say, let there be a man, let there be humanity. Like he took his time, right? He took his time. To, like he took, some, he took some soil from the, the ground and with his own hands, he created the man in his own image. And he breathed his breath of life into him and he became alive. And he was good. But before long, the crafty serpent, if there was anyone that was ever so full of pride, so puffed up, and in their own agenda, sin entered the world. There was temptation. There was, you could give as the world gives, and, and Adam and Eve, they took as the world gives, they bit from the forbidden fruit, and sin entered the world, and sin separated us from the Heavenly Father that was in perfect communion with us. Sent into the world, and Adam and Eve, they listened to the pride full of lies of a puffed up fallen angel, and perfect peace was marred by sin, and the scars of, of sin have, have been pressed down on us, and they've continued to oppress us, pressed into us even, and we need the peace back. Well, God has a, a peace treaty, God has a rescue plan, it's in effect right now. So God wants our peace enough that he became one of us. He sent his son to be born among us, a prince of peace. He loves us enough to pay the price of our sin. He sent his son, prince of peace, on a cross. He's powerful enough to roll back his own tombstone. He's faithful enough to prepare a place for us. After Jesus rose from the dead, he told his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Can imagine it's a place of peace, right? <clears throat> this peace is only available by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. See, Christ alone saves us from the sin that separates us from God. You know Christ's first words when he saw his disciples again after his resurrection? After Christ removes his own tombstone, the disciples are hiding and they're in prayer and they're worried. I can imagine their hearts are troubled. I can imagine they don't have peace at the moment. The first words Jesus says to his disciples. Yes, you got it. Peace. Peace. Peace be with you. It's common greeting. Do you know how his apostles first responded to witness the resurrected Jesus Christ? So think about John, John who, who was at the foot of the cross. He's taking care of Jesus' mama now. He's worried for his own life. When the apostles saw Jesus, when they heard him say, peace be with you, it says they were terrified. <laughs> like, forget about it. There's no peace. They were immediately terrified into what Jesus followed up with a question. He goes, why are you troubled? And we're considering the source. He says, my peace I give you. Like, don't be troubled. Realize, I just defeated death by my own power. I said I would, and I did. I'm a man of my word. Jesus proved he was alive, and he told his disciples, now, now get to work. Because that same fear that you've been feeling, that same anxiety, that same anger, that's what the world knows, and that's what the world is stuck in. So go deliver us the peace. Go, go deliver the shalom that I am giving you. Because the world needs that kind of peace. Not the kind of world that, not the kind of peace that the world gives that doesn't last. Go give my peace that is everlasting. Get to work. I think about, we are here today. And some of you told me this church has been here a long time. 100 plus years. People of peace. Had a message of peace. I want to make sure that we can gather together to, to proclaim God's peace to each other and, and tell all of Somerset there's, there's a God who loves us and he is peaceful. And because those people were faithful in, in spreading that peace, we heard the peace, we continued to let this be a place of peace. That our homes would be a place of peace. That peace we desire, like when we go back to the beginning, when it was good before sin. God's bringing that back. And we get to be a part of the process of that. In fact, Go to the last book of the Bible again. We'll go to Revelation 21. Who records these words? John. John, who I'm sure was troubled because Jesus said, why are you troubled? 
When he gets a glimpse of what's going to happen in the end. Revelation 21 verse 4. We'll close with this. That he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, pain will be no more. Because the previous things passed away. Right. 